This year we celebrate the 275th anniversary of our noble society, though in truth 1743 is a shadowy date. Some think the APS began in 1727, when Benjamin Franklin, at age 21, convened his famous junto, as Linda has explained, a secret self-improvement group, 12 in number and limited to that size. Though the APS website today claims our society as a, quote, offshoot of Franklin's junto, Printer Ben's group died an early death um, maybe Linda and I will quibble about this a bit, um, but regardless of its shortness of years, it did remain in historical memory as a monument to the intellectual capacity or curiosity and the civic virtue of ambitious craftsmen in William Penn's city of brotherly love. A more legitimate though still problematic starting point for APS is in 1743, I'm a bit, a bit irreverent here. Four years earlier, John Bartram, former farmer and botanical investigator, first proposed a society to promote natural, natural history. Then in 43, he teamed up with Franklin to issue, quote, a proposal for promoting useful knowledge among the British plantations in America. Its first seven members called themselves the American Philosophical Society, and 18 new members, mostly from New York and New Jersey, mostly men of wealth and social standing, soon added some weight. However, Franklin and Bartram soon discovered they had a sick child on their hands. The initial proposal called for at least one meeting each month, and the society met only sporadically and seldom more than a handful of members present. Franklin wrote in 1745, two years later, quote, the members of our society here are very idle gentlemen who will take no pains spending their time in the club, chess, and coffee house rather than studying natural history and other topics. Unhappily, in 1746, the society died in its crib, and the corpse was not disinterred for 20 years. A similar but different society took form in 1750. A look on the left under Franklin's Junto, um, and this also met um, young Junto, they called themselves, 12 Philadelphians, also meeting as a secret mutual improvement group. By 1759, Membership was down to eight. By 1761, five. No meetings were held between 1762 and 1766. It was a frail group composed of only 31 members over its 16 years. But at least this second sickly child served up interesting topics for discussion. As their mission statement said, on, quote, morals, politics, the sciences, or other prudential and useful subjects. Among them, quote, what are the common causes that occasion the downfall of an empire? Or by what means do plants propagate their species? Or can they fruit without flowering? Another, is it good policy to admit the importation of Negroes into America? And finally, one full of resonance today, my favorite, what is the difference between a falsity and a lie? <laughs> then in 1766, Charles Thompson, a recent immigrant with energy and vision, fashioned a set of proposals to change the composition and character of the young, the young Junto. He gathered a group of nine, modestly situated Quakers, including two of John Bartram's sons. Thompson proposed to reorient the meetings from moral and philosophical issues to science, mechanical arts, agriculture, and trade. And then came a name change in December 1766, not to the American Philosophical Society, but to the American society held at Philadelphia 
for promoting and propagating useful knowledge. This occurred as the city was abuzz over Parliament's tax policies meant to bring the rambunctious American colonies under strict account. Among the first topics discussed were, quote, whether Roman Catholics should enjoy civil rights, which they did not in Pennsylvania, and should women be admitted into councils of state, unquote. One year later, the eminent physician Thomas Bond wrote Franklin, his bosom friend, now in England, that he had, quote, long meditated a revival of our, of our American philosophical society, and so he did, gathering a group of Philadelphia doctors, mostly, to resuscitate the long dormant APS established in 1743. Rather than what Brooke Hindle called a den of liberal Quakers, uh, as he called the members of the young Junto, who had just come back to life as the American society, this new APS was a group of men more diverse in religious commitments, but decidedly conservative on the burning imperial issues of the day. Moreover, it was aligned with the proprietary party, led by William Penn's grandsons. Now Philadelphia had two sparring groups, each eager to become a general scientific society. And as Hindle explains, each dominated by one of the city's political factions, unquote. Competition, it turned out, was beneficial. In a membership war, By 1768, the American Society on the left enrolled 78 resident and 60, 67 corresponding members. Especially heavy with doctors, this group included many friends of Franklin, many prospering artisans, and five members of the Moravian community in Bethlehem, one of whom was married to Wampanoag woman. A few were British officers stationed in the colonies Many were of the corresponding members were British West Indies officials. And as a whole, they were aligned with Franklin in calling for the end of the Penn family's hold on the affairs of Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, back to the right, the American Philosophical Society quickly boasted 92 resident member, members and 36 corresponding members. Included were most of the high-ranking officials of the colony, plenty of doctors, and many of the city's wealthiest merchants, most with few scientific leanings, but heavy with affluence and political influence. Then, while political tensions uh, in the city grew, the two groups put aside differences in religion, social standing, occupation, and politics to do a most unlikely thing, a decision to merge. On December 20, 1768. It was a, quote, union on terms of perfect equality, read the APS minutes. How remarkable this was can be appreciated by glancing at what was happening on the ground. As the two societies conducted their membership war and insulted each other while jockeying to negotiate a merger, the Townsend Act of 1767 Parliament's attempt to bring the fractious American colonies to heel by slapping stiff duties on paper, lead, paint, and tea had triggered a boycott of British imports in Boston and New York and non-consumption pledges by the ordinary consumers led by women who held the purse strings of the household economy. But Philadelphia, when merchants refused to join the economic boycott, some of these newly elected uh, in the membership competition were called by Philadelphia's artisans and small shopkeepers, quote, contemptible to the last degree for their mercenary principles and abject pusillanimity, unquote. In 1769, the merchants caved in, pledging a boycott of British imports that only a year later they attempted to scuttle. Trying to stanch a political upsurge from below, they told artisans they had, quote, no right to give their sentiments respecting an importation. It was the beginning of the end 
for the whole of the Philadelphia elite on public affairs and the end of customary deference from below in, to the well-born and wealthy. Now, turning back to the newborn merged philosophical society, we can briefly note three six significant moments that followed one after another after that epic year of 1768 and as the argument with the mother country intensified. The first was electing officers of the merged societies. To overcome political, professional, and social rifts, they adroitly elected three vice presidents, three secretaries, and three curators. As for president, two names came forward. Franklin, still over the ocean in London, and James Hamilton, Pennsylvania's governor, appointed by the Penn family proprietors of the colony. No surprise, Franklin was the winner, though he would not return to Philadelphia um, for, for almost until 1775. Now the second moment was entirely fortuitous, the transit of Venus, which occurred on June 1st, 1769. Almost as if the celestial system understood that the APS merger needed a chance to show off its members' talents. Among those deeply involved in charting Venus as it crossed the face of the sun was David Rittenhouse. With his mathematical skills and his 144 power refracting telescope, APS members seized the moment, knowing that Philadelphians would not be able to observe and calculate the transit of Venus for another 105 years. The third benchmark moment was the publication of an APS journal, the customary way of presenting a society's research to the world of learning. Titled Transactions of the American Philosophical Society, the first volume dribbled forth piecemeal in Philadelphia newspapers in 1769, then appeared as a collected volume of papers in 1771, ripe with papers on the transit of Venus. It sold briskly. It brought praise from London to Berlin to St. Petersburg. It established APS's international bona fides. A second volume would not appear until long after the long war for independence, but a dime had been dropped. Now the APS seemed poised to move forward, strong in numbers, able in leadership, energized by its members' scientific and natural history contributions. But it was not to be. Attendance withered after 1769, and the society retreated to a cave as the onset of the revolution divided its members and diverted their attention. As Brooke Hindle tells us, quote, the men, the institutions, and the interrelationships that sustain science were badly disturbed and disrupted, unquote. The always enlightened Benjamin Rush pleaded, quote, in science of every kind of men should consider themselves citizens of the whole world, unquote. But meetings of the APS as war came on fell into abeyance, resuming in late 1783 when the energetic Francis Hopkinson cudgeled the society, warning they would, quote, sink into contempt, unquote, if they did not revive. And revive they did. Spurred by the establishment in Boston in 1780 of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a rival group, pushed along after peace returned in 1783 by a cultural efflorescence in the form of new colleges, newspapers, magazines, and libraries, inspired by new leadership, especially the return of the magical Franklin in 1786 from France, and uplifted by building a philosophical hall of their own, completed in 1785 and occupied continuously ever since. The society looked to a bright future. The revival is evident in the burst in character of the post-revolutionary years. We have nothing to draw upon akin to Whitfield Bell's three-volume biographical sketches of members of the APS, which gloriously uh, portrays members elected 
through 1768, but not beyond. But I can report that in the post-revolution years of revival from 1784 to 91, the society tripled the intake of members from eight per year in the years of imperial crisis and war to 23 per year in the decade following the war. Almost 40% of these new members were Europeans, mostly French and English, with a scattering of Dutch, Italian, and Spanish, giving our society a vivid transatlantic countenance. Some were almost household names by this time, Joseph Priestley, Thomas Paine, Thaddeus Kosciusko, and Richard Price, for example. Others, such as Jan Ingenhouse, Dutch biologist and chemist, who discovered pho photosynthesis in plants, are known today only to specialists. Many others have faded into history. One who has lived on and celebrated by our society with an exhibit 12 years ago was Princess Catherine Ekaterina Dashkova, director, as Linda said, of the Imperial Academy of Sciences in Russia. In 1789, the first woman elected, she was age 45 and singular in this regard, as you've heard, for 80 years. By the end of the Washington presidency, in 1797, the Philosophical Society was a thoroughly internationalized, multidisciplined, vibrant academy, blending scientists, inventors, political leaders, philosophers, and writers of distinction. If my quick survey of the members inducted after the revolution to the time Jefferson was elected APS president in 1797 is correct, there is one category notable for its absence, social or political reformers. Within this category, ending three centuries of the Atlantic slave trade and setting slavery on the road to extinction in the Western Hemisphere were the most pressing issues of the era, with Quakers setting the, re the reform agenda from their Atlantic Basin, Basin centers in Philadelphia and London. Yet missing among the inductees were their standard bearers, Anthony Benizet, John Parrish, Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, Henri Grégoire, Granville Sharp. Let me end with a poignant and bittersweet moment as the 18th century grew, drew to a close. When Jefferson arrived in Philadelphia in March 1787 to serve as John Adams' vice president, he found himself entirely frozen out of the Adams Federalist administration. His election that month to the APS presidency made Philosophical Hall his constant place of refuge. He and Adams would cross the street so they would not have to walk on the same sidewalk together, never exchanging even a nod. At his first meeting in the chair as president of the APS, Jefferson sat between Comte de Valny, a leading figure of the French Enlightenment, and Joseph Priestley, England's eminent chemist and philosopher. And then, Jefferson found another place of refuge on the second floor at 3rd and Pine Street, where he forged a close friendship with Thaddeus Kosciusko, Washington's military engineer and a national hero in Poland for leading an insurrection in 1793 against the Russian occupiers of his homeland. Kosciusko had been elected to the APS in 1785, Jefferson in 1780. Kosciusko may not have heard of the election. He certainly wasn't inducted because he was rotting away in the St. Petersburg prison under the Russian Tsar. 
But he was released from prison, and he brought with him this fur collar, which he presented to Jefferson at 3rd and Pine Street. He came back to America, still badly disabled by battlefield wounds, to receive his long overdue military pay uh, from Congress. Meeting almost daily, Jefferson soon, soon called him, quote, as pure a son of liberty as I have ever known, unquote. And then the two APS members, as Kosciuszko was about to leave the country forever with a forged passport furnished by Jefferson, they worked up together Kosciuszko's will for seven years of military pay. And in that will, Jefferson at his elbow, Jefferson was made the executor and the beneficiary of a large sum of money to be used by the APS president to free his slaves of Monticello or others of his choice. It might have changed the course of history if only its provisions had been followed when Kosciuszko died in 1817. William Lloyd Garrison said, what an all-conquering influence must have attended Jefferson's illustrious example if the author of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington's Secretary of State, the third president of the United States, had fulfilled his Polish friend's will. And it was not to be. Another story for another time. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. That's quite a quite an ending. Wow. Um, Barbara, do you have anything that you'd like to supplement? Um, well, the only thing I was going to talk about was, um, uh, all right, that's, is that all right? Yeah. Is that better? The words that Linda read of Franklin creating the Junto and calling for debates that would be civil without fondness for disputes or de desire of victory are very like the words that Franklin used at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 in his final speech when he said, I've learned a lot of things over my life, and one of them is that disputes don't get us anywhere. I would ask us all to doubt a little of our own infallibility and realize that the Constitution is not perfect, but it is probably the best that we are ever going to have and so we should support it. So what he learned when, from writing the rules for the Gento were how to behave in a civilized society and how the APS could in fact encourage membership and encourage debate at its meetings. So that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Questions, anybody? Conrad, are you up there? Yeah, okay, Conrad Harper. Okay. Wait. Wait, it's coming <laughs> behind you. That was one of the more remarkable endings of any speech in this hall. My name is Conrad Harper, I'm from New York City. But I wanna ask you in consequence uh, of that statement, Professor Nash, what happened to the money? <laughs> oh, it cost you about $20 and the bookstore still has a few copies left. <laughs> <laughs> it's, cost, it's called Friends of Liberty, Thomas Jefferson, Thaddeus Kosciuszko and Agrippa Hull. Agrippa Hull was a stock, Stockbridge free black man who uh, was Kosciuszko's orderly and had a huge influence on Kosciuszko in trying to um, give all of his military money to Jefferson to set an example in freeing the Monticello slaves. Uh, <laughs> but no, 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 I know. <laughs> um, what happened? Uh, 
Jefferson kept up his correspondence with Kosciuszko for many years, invited him to come and live out his days in Monticello. He said, we will eat together, uh, we will live together, uh, we will die together. Kosciuszko, who was banished to live out his life in Switzerland, said, no, I must remain on the other side of the Atlantic. <clears throat> and when Kosciuszko died in 1817, Jefferson got on his horse and rode down the hill to the Albemarle County Courthouse, um, walked into the court and said, if I please the court, um, I have something to present, and out of his pocket came the original copy of Kosciuszko's will. Um, Thomas Jefferson um, Wurtenbaker, uh, who taught colonial history at Princeton for a long time. It was his grandfather who was the county clerk, and he recorded all this in the Albemarle Apple, County um, um, books. And Jefferson said politely that he must decline serving as executor and the beneficiary of the will. And it was so recorded in the books. And then the Kosciuszko fortune um, was litigated for over 30 years. And its disposition, the money, as it continued to grow, um, it was the Chief Justice Tawney who decided that it, it could not be used in America at all. Um, the attempts were made to use it to establish a school for free blacks. <laughs> Um, and the money was sent back to Europe because Shisko had no children. Uh, it fell into the hands of, um, I guess it was great nieces, a sister's children. That's sort of the short version of the story. Wow. Okay. Um, Michael. Uh, Michael Silverstein, Chicago. Um, uh, Bob Hauser um, before reminded us that our um, endowment is in very good shape. Um, uh, and I'm wondering about the finances during the 18th century of both the precursor, the Junto, uh, the Young Junto, and the American Society and the American Philosophical Society, since um, uh, uh, these, these kinds of things like having meetings and building buildings and so forth do not come without financial obligations. So what was, the, what was the financial arrangements of these in the early days? If I may also ask, um, um, John Adams, among others, um, really was desperate to start national academies of various sorts. Um, and um, of course, the APS remains a private institution uh, in the United States, though it operates like many of the, uh, many of the nation state academies overseas, um, similarly the AAAS and so forth. It was not for another hundred years or more that the National Academies uh, were started, which were in fact congressionally uh, uh, chartered. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about that in those early days, was there in fact a move to turn this into a National Academy? No, I don't believe so. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the frailty of, of the financial structure you know, the foundations were very weak. And um, increasing membership is one way. Uh, how can you do it with 10 or 20 or 30 or even 60 or 80 members? So the attempt after the re revolution was to pump up membership a lot. But then, as Linda explained, in the 19th century, it falls on hard times during Depression years. And there were several severe ones in 1837, 1857, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, I might be exceeding my, uh, you know, my, my knowledge, but I think there was something very Jeffersonian about a private academy that was not, you know, part of a governmental structure. And I think that notion was really kind of hardwired into, into the organization. Um, and that's part of the, 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 the legacy. Uh, questionnaire, yeah. Mary Washington, Denver, Colorado. Dr. Nash, uh, as you said, 
the if the will had been distributed as was as it should have been, it would have changed the whole course of where we are now. How many slaves were involved possibly that could have been saved? Well, oh, uh, if Jefferson had used Kosciuszko's money, um, it would have been sufficient to um, uh, take market value, to put it crassly and free, um, about um, 170 slaves at Monticello and the two other plantations that Jefferson maintained. Uh, so it would have been close uh, uh, for, uh, to actually bail Jefferson out of debt. He was deeply in debt. He could have taken the money, used it to, uh, to erase his debts, and at the same time free um, uh, Monticello and other slaves. Um, would it have changed history? Uh, <laughs> If the President of the United States, the third president, if the author of the Declaration of Independence, um, we, could have a, we could have a good argument over that, um, and maybe over a glass of wine we'll have a chance to do that, but I mean, that's a very complex, thorny question for sure. Some, to some extent, I suppose it depends on what, what you think is the power, the, the moral persuasive energy, the leadership of, of one, of a son of the Enlightenment to change minds in the planter class of the South. What is sure is that many of Jefferson's friends were freeing their slaves, and two of them were writing pamphlets published here in Philadelphia in the 1790s with gradual abolition schemes. Lorraine Daston, Berlin and Chicago. A question about the Junto. Um, the Royal Society of London, which was one of its models, founded shortly after the Restoration in 1660, forbade discussion of politics and religion as two topics which inflame tempers to the point where reasonable discussion was no longer possible. Were there any forbidden topics of the Junto? No, there, as far as I know, there were not forbidden topics, but actually in that long list that I read of the topics on the agenda, neither religion nor politics was on that list. So maybe by omission, that wasn't part of what they were supposed to be talking about. It's an interesting point. I was wondering how, I mean, David Sabatini from New York, how active was the Philosophical Society during the Revolutionary War? How active was the society during the Revolutionary War? particularly in nominating foreign members. I just coincidentally, completely accidentally, I learned that, that a military from the, from the alliance with France became elected to both the Philosophical Society and the American Society for Arts and Sciences. So how, I think- The name is the Marquis de Castelux, whose biography is indeed written now. So how, how active was the society during the Revolutionary War given the Particularly international reach? In, in, in the nomination of foreign members. In the for example, French members, who were members of the alliance that was signed in 1778 and until 1798. I don't know. The, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we need we need a successor to Whitfield Bell, Bell, who can pick up where he left off in 1768. Um, and I don't think, for that matter, we have a we have a, a good history of, of the APS in the uh, Brooke Hindle's pursuit of science in revolutionary America uh, is is I think the best thing we have on the APS um, as part of this general survey of science, but he only goes to the 1790s and stops there in the long era of the revolution. So there's, there's work out there for retired member of the APS perhaps to <laughs> okay. pick up the cudgels here. Okay, that's the last that we have time for. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah.